You could be doing everything right and hormonal loss can still cause weight gain. When you lose your hormones, you lose your hormones. We know from research that women have a higher need for protein when they're in menopause. There's some women that come into this world with the genetics to be estrogenic. Testosterone is our most abundant hormone. Women don't know that. They all think that testosterone is just for the guy. Well, we produce more testosterone than we do estrogen or progesterone. Most women don't know that either. They don't realize that that's when you start to lose progesterone because you don't ovulate as often. And if you're not ovulating as often, you're not going to be producing progesterone. You don't want to wait till you're 47, you're a hot mess, you're 20 pounds overweight, can't sleep, and now you're going to go, okay, I need help with my hormones. Things are really bad. No. The sooner you can get on this, the better. And unfortunately, majority of doctors out there won't treat a woman until she is in menopause. Finding just a functional doctor isn't always the answer either. I have come across countless naturopaths and functional medicine practitioners that have no clue what they're doing when it comes to hormones because that's not their specialty. At what point, Karen, should a woman consider taking bioidentical hormones? There is a right way to do it. So at what point should women consider it? Mm -hmm. Well... Karen Martell, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thank you for having me, Ben. I'm happy to be here. This is fun because we just did a recording on your podcast where you interviewed me and now the tables have turned and I get to interview you. Uh, I just love your work, but more importantly than that, your energy, your enthusiasm, how you show up in this world. It's just, it's fun to talk to you. So I'm glad we're doing this back to back. And the reason is because our mutual friend, Daniel Hamilton connected us yes. and we're both speaking at this amazing event in Sarasota, Florida at Dr. John Lawrence's clinic. For those who listen to the podcast or watch it on YouTube, we just had Dr. John on. He was actually sitting right here. We recorded a podcast. We oh, spoke nice. about the event. This episode is actually the next episode right after Dr. John Laurent. So it's perfect timing, <laughs> but uh, Karen's going to be speaking there. I'll be speaking there. I'm going to drop a link for that down below with the coupon code for you to get your uh, discounted uh, ticket price off that ticket. Um, I want to talk to you, Karen, about your backstory. You have been yeah. somebody who has, like so many people out there, struggled with your health. You told me on the interview with you on, on your podcast, there was a lot of mental things going on as well. So let's take it back and uh, share your story. What were some of the challenges you had and what got you into this this health space? Yeah, I kind of have two stories, but I'll, I'll condense them <laughs> so that we're not here all day hearing about Karen. Um, mine started after the birth of my first child. Um, you know, lost all the baby weight. It was a good year and a half later. I had stopped breastfeeding and then suddenly things started to change and I hadn't changed my diet. I was always a pretty good eater, health conscious when it came to that kind of stuff and hadn't done anything differently. And I started to gain weight and I started to have a lot of other health problems all surrounding. It seemed like my menstrual cycle. So when I would get my period, I would start getting these migraines that would last for 10 days, some of them. It was really, really bad. I started getting chronic insomnia uh, where I really could not sleep all night long. And I had, I was a single mother of a toddler and I would fall asleep around three or four o'clock every morning and then have to get up a few hours later with my child. And digestive problems. I looked, I was looking like I was pregnant still by the end of the day. My stomach was so bloated and sticking out. I was super tired. I was having horrible PMS and depression. And I went out and I did everything that, you know, a woman does when this happens. And I started to work out harder. I went, you know, st research every diet that was out there. I went vegan. Uh, then I started juicing. I, I bought myself a juicer and started to try and you know, detox. Um, I then went to Adkins. I did the zone diet. Yeah. Uh, you name it, I did it. Calorie counted, started going to a CrossFit like gym, started working out like crazy six days a week. And I just got fatter and fatter and fatter until I was at an all time high and I was very severely depressed, could not believe what happened to my body. And I was literally starving myself and I could not lose a pound. And I was working out like I had never worked out before in my life. I was probably in the best shape of my life and I was at the fattest I ever was. How old were you? I was 32. Wow. Yeah, that's young. Yeah. 
Yeah, and went to the doctor and of course she doesn't, you know, have a clue. She says, Well, here's your sleeping medication, which I took. Great I was very grateful for that. And here's your antidepressant and sent me on my way. Which I did try that too, didn't last. Um, but I did end up on those prescription sleeping pills for many years, unfortunately. And I finally realized there's has I had to take charge of my own health and I had to figure out what was going on. And I knew that it had something to do with my hormones because of it being always around my period that things would always get worse. And so I started to research hormones. And of course, nobody's going to tell a 32 year old woman that it's her hormones. That would never happen. And I ended up going to a naturopath who was a friend of mine. And I was like, could you, do you think you could test my hormones for me? And he said, oh yeah, I can do that. And tested my hormones. And sure enough, I had all of these hormonal problems. My estrogen was super high. I had no progesterone and it bottomed out. My cortisol was super low, like across the board. My DHEA, which is another adrenal hormone, was also super low. Um, Had I checked... I would have also seen that my thyroid had crashed, which I I didn't check for many years actually until a long time afterwards. But I know that back then that's what had happened as well is that my thyroid went haywire. Very common for women for this to happen post-pregnancy. These children, they they just steal everything from you. So <laughs> they just really screw things up. No. Anyways, it went I went on this journey then of trying to figure out what's going on with my hormones. I had to really take a, a look at my life because I did not think I was a stressed out person, which come on, I was a single mother of a toddler, running my own business at the time. I was highly stressed out, had very little help. But I didn't consider myself a stressed out person. I just was doing what everybody else was doing. So I actually quit working out. I started doing yoga, started getting help, asking for help, and managing my hormones. And at that time, through that same naturopath, he said, and this was a long time ago, he's, he said, this is probably 2008, um, 2009, and he said, I went to a conference and one of the the best diets that they say that is, you know, the best for longevity and that's going to get, that's kind of coming down the pipeline is a ketogenic diet. <laughs> Nobody had heard of it yeah. up here then. This that's is really like, early on before it was really um, known at all. Yeah. And so I went out and I bought Mark Sisson's nice. Primal Blueprint, which Classic. I saw you just interviewed him. And yeah, I was like, yeah. oh, you're so lucky. Because yeah. he was like my first, like he got me into this world of paleo and I went paleo and I haven't stopped. And I've been paleo ever since. Um, it took a long time for me to heal the hormonal system. I did have to work a lot on the emotional stuff that I feel like was a really big part of it. I think my body was kind of finally calling out to me to pay attention to it, to love it. Um, I had had come from a history of alcoholism and drug abuse and sexual abuse. And I had a lot of things to work on because I did not like myself. I did not like my body. I hated it. And so it took a lot of spiritual work, a lot of getting some help and working through stuff, you know, working through everything. And finally, my body started to let go of the weight. And so it wasn't an easy journey. It wasn't a quick fix by any means. But I came out of the experience going, I can't be the only woman that is doing everything right and and barely eating and exercising and doing everything right. And yet I was just gaining weight. And so I kind of went on this little mission of trying to figure out like, how can I help women like me? So I became a nutritionist. And then over the years, I was working with women and weight loss and ketogenic diet, paleo based diet. And then at the age of 42, I hit another hormonal wall. My thyroid crashed and I went into menopause at 42 and I gained 20 pounds in six months. Wow. And so that was severely hard on me because at this point I'm I'm already an established weight loss coach. I was a hormone coach. I was in this industry and I suddenly very rapidly gained all of this weight because I went into menopause very early so that is too early most women go into menopause around 50 52 so I I reversed it Um, once again took a little bit of time but I was able to reverse it and came out of that going I've got to help I have to help more women that are going through this perimenopause and menopausal phase that don't understand that you could be doing everything right 
And hormonal loss can still cause weight gain. And it doesn't, you cannot diet your way out of that. You can't supplement your way out of that. When you lose your hormones, you lose your hormones. And the consequences are different for each person. But typically for over 80% of women, it can be very detrimental to your body and your health. Wow. What a story. And I know Wayne Dyer played a big role in that. We have that in common yes. with, the, with the mindset part. When you said you reversed it, what did you mean? The menopause? You, you reverse your menopause is what you're yeah. saying. Because you, yep. you, now you have a cycle is what you're saying. Yes. Yes. And I'm 47. And you're 47. Okay. Explain that more because I don't think most women could understand they could reverse that. Um, when, when you say you were 42 and you hit menopause, how many months had it been? Because isn't menopause categorized as 12 months without a period or was it? That's true. So I wasn't, I was not technically 12 months without a period. Okay. You were perimenopause. What? No, nope. I was going into menopause. You were going like, into it menopause. It was... Because what happened was there was no peri really prior to it. Got it. So I was ticking along just fine. And then within six months, and I'll, I'll explain what happened, but within six months, my FSH, follicular stimulating hormone, went, it skyrocketed. It went into the 30s, mm. which that is menopausal range. And my estrogen dropped. My progesterone completely bottomed out. Thyroid dropped again, which I think was the fuel to all of this. And so I suddenly was missing periods, was hot flashing, night sweating. All of my weight went into my stomach. This is very typical menopausal weight gain area. Yeah. I had like really, really light periods. I had really itchy skin. My breasts were like super swollen and I could, couldn't touch them. They were so painful. So I had all, I couldn't get off my couch. I was depressed. Like mm. it hit so hard, so fast. And that's unusual. Like most women, it'll be 10 years of perimenopause. Then they have a couple years of what I was going through. Well, it gets kind of worse and worse. Then they have a year without a period. And then the one, that first day where it's been a year without a period is technically one day of menopause and then yeah. after that day you're post menopause yeah. which is really stupid there's no <laughs> rhyme or reason why they say it's what has to be one year they just made that up it yeah. was like right. we're just gonna say yeah. that it's one year it's pretty arbitrary and yeah. then you're in menopause yeah. and that's not fair to women because if you get to you know 350 days let's say and you get a period oh now you got to start counting from day one and you can't technically call yourself menopausal right so Fair i say point. i was in menopause like i was i was hitting it and hard and so i was like okay i gotta reverse this and i ended up i was able to reverse it by changing some things around um replacing the hormones that were plummeting to the floor and figuring out kind of what the thyroid how that connected with the hormones and the thyroid medication that I was taking that kind of really screwed me up and nobody told me these things like nobody told me that thyroid medication raises sex hormone binding globulin mm. and so I was on all this thyroid medication and it started to bind up my testosterone and my estrogen which made it so that I went into menopause earlier interesting yeah. I mean, how, how many listening and watching uh, the ladies out there have a, a similar story? Even even guys, we, we look at these different diets and Atkins and counting calories. And I think the challenge with these different tools, and I'm curious to see if this happened with you, when we start to change to an Atkins diet or do uh, more exercise or do calorie counting, in the beginning, a lot of people get some benefits and some results. And then all of a sudden it stops and then they lose those results and they actually harm themselves. So did you notice any results short term with some of those changes or right off the bat, it did not work for you and none of them worked for you? None of them worked. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I went down to, I probably was eating at some points, maybe 800 calories a day. Wow. That's and really I, low. I couldn't lose a single pound. You were probably hungry all day too. Oh yeah. I was ready to eat my arm off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 With, and then like the muscle build, like I was building muscle, working out, like, cr like I had never worked out like that before. And I still kept getting fatter. I could go keto. I could go and none of it would have worked. And yeah. when I hit it at 42, I actually knew that. Like I was like, I, there's no, I'm not going to do anything with my diet. I was already a good eater. 
but I was tempted. I started to go down those old pathways of maybe I better starve my, not starve myself literally, but maybe I better fast more. Maybe I better go lower carb. Maybe I better. And then I was like, no, you know that that's not going to work. You've got weight loss resistance because of the hormones. And so I didn't stress my sis. I tried not to stress my system out with like, let's try every diet under the sun and let's see what, what can happen here. I didn't want to go down that pathway anymore. I knew better. And so I knew that I had to work on it from a different angle. And I took a really different approach to it. And I actually, I started to prioritize protein, but I didn't count calories. Like I was like, no, I'm just going to count my protein and make sure that I get enough protein in. Really focused on putting muscle on. And it did slowly start to change. And I lost 10 pounds doing it like that. And I was able to drop down half of it. Um from there so amazing yeah yeah you said you said you're 47 now was that what you said mm -hmm. yeah well i mean you don't if you're watching on youtube you don't clearly look like you're 47 you look a lot younger and your energy is a lot uh younger too uh, if that makes sense like you have like the energy of like a teenager essentially like you're really <laughs> high energy which is great it's a compliment uh, so obviously what you're doing is working so yeah. um my audience right are, are primarily women who listen and watch the keto camp podcast they're doing keto. I'm educating them that we love keto, but it's different for women versus men and we don't do it long term. So I'd love for you to teach them um, some of the, the principles to hormone health when it comes as it relates to a low carbohydrate diet. Some of the things that you do with your clients uh, when it comes to keto and women's hormone hormone health. And we could start with the woman who has a menstrual cycle and then we can move on to the postmenopausal woman. Yeah, so in my programs, I have something called the Hormone and Metabolic Reboot Meal Plan. We just call it the HMR for short. Very similar to your Keto Flex because I, like you, came from that hardcore keto world. I got super into it. I had every client on keto for probably two years, was doing it myself. And then I started to see all of these, these issues arise where women were coming in with missing periods. They were losing their hair. They were gaining the weight back. And their answer was, well, I better do this harder. I better now start eating one meal a day instead of two. I better start fasting. Fasting for 24 hours, 36 hours, five-day fast, water fast, carnivore. And that was their, what everybody was coming in going, I better just do this harder. And it was like, no, stop. <laughs> and I had to start going, okay, what is happening here? Because it worked so well in the beginning. And you know this, Ben, like... They, they feel great. Sometimes it's the best they have ever felt. And when it came to their hormones, I was having menopausal women coming through the door going, I have no more hot flashes. Mm. Like, I feel fantastic. I'm finally able to lose weight, even though I'm in menopause, because I went keto. And so there was so many great benefits to it that, you know, when it was easy, people could go for hours without eating and not have all that food noise. And they just had more energy. And it was like all this... It's like, it was amazing. It was like a miracle. It was like, we finally found the diet. So then what happened? You know, like it's it, why long-term did it stop working? And then I started to look into like exactly what was happening to the thyroid and to the other hormonal system. And it just made sense coming from that kind of hunter-gatherer perspective of if there's not a lot of food around, yeah, your body would have gone into ketosis. And we had this backup source of fuel so that we wouldn't die. So if we are constantly telling ourselves that we're in this famine, that it's winter, that there's not a lot of food around, which is what you're telling your system, you're telling that female body that is just here purely to procreate. That is it. That's the only purpose for the woman's body to be here. And a man is here just to spread that seed around. Yeah. And, you know, even if you don't want to have kids, it doesn't matter. That's still what on the inside your body is running for it's that's what it's that's what it does that's what its whole purpose is so if we're we have to come at it from that perspective of what are you signaling to the system if you're always without carbohydrates if there's no fruit then it means we're always in winter then there's no, there's not a lot of food around if you're eating only meat and it's carnivore you're, you're telling your body you're never in summertime. There's no carbohydrates around. Not the time to get pregnant. And we see this, like, even just naturally, you'll see on people's blood work, thyroid goes down kind of naturally in the winter. 
you're and that's like this slow metabolic slowdown because it's like okay this is when we're not we don't have we're not supposed to have a lot of food around so let's preserve the energy women will start to gain always a little bit of weight in the winter this is very normal common even men have a testosterone cycle where their testosterone drops in the winter and it springs up in the spring Mm, interesting yeah and so women were monthly but you guys are yearly with your cycle and so this all makes sense it all makes sense so we have to start to signal to the system that there is abundance and that you can get pregnant even if you don't want to we have to tell the body that and so that's where the keto flex comes in or that for me it's just carb ups right like a couple days a week you got to put some carbs back into the diet you got to bring up the calories and you and you have to bring up the carbohydrates i'm a big proponent of protein because i've seen that work best for women especially menopausal women where if you prioritize protein life is a lot easier when it comes to being able to lose weight maintain muscle Um, and we know from research that women have a higher need for protein when they're in menopause. Um, There's been some great research done by uh, the two authors that wrote Eat Like the Animals. Have you interviewed them? No, I haven't. Come on. Connect me, You will love them. You will love them. Yeah, please connect me. (laughs) You got to read the book, Eat Like the Animals. It's great. They did this amazing, amazing research. It's actually a really good book to read. It's funny and it's interesting. And it's these two Australian guys that they're, you know, they, they studied animals, basically. But they started to see this pattern that then they, they then researched it in humans, which is human beings will automatically overeat carbohydrates and fat to meet their protein threshold. Ah. And menopausal women have a higher, higher protein threshold that they need to meet. And so you will overeat carbs and fat if you do not get that protein. So you have to prioritize the protein so you don't overeat the carbs and fat. And so it they, works. They came up with that protein leverage hypothesis. Um, is that who came up with it? Because that's what it is. I mean, the- I don't think that they were the ones that came up with that um, because there's this more in the last few years. And okay. I know the protein leverage hypothesis came from a long time ago through, I think Lyle McDonald was one of the first ones that talked about protein leverage. I forget. But or no, it- I'm talking about the protein sparing diet. Okay, That's but, but it makes sense to me that um, we need those essential amino acids and we overeat processed food that are devoid of them to try to get that, right? So yeah, uh, we talked about this on, on your podcast. Protein is so important. So I hope that's like a, a, a note-taking action right there for those listening and watching. Eat more protein, not just women, but men out there. Eat more protein. Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, You don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's going to cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60-minute massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audio book. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com 
slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code. Bond charge hooked you up. So head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your bond charge products. All right, let's get back to today's video. You asked me the question, what's your recommendation for protein. I'll ask you the question right back. What is your recommendation for protein for your clients? Similar to yours, I, I do think that if you're not lifting weights, which you should be, but if you're not, because maybe you can't or you don't like it, then I'm, I, I say lower, right? So not quite one pound per or one gram per pound of body weight, I would say more like 0.5 or 0.8 if you're not lifting weights. If you are lifting weights, then I would say, yeah, you want to hit that gram per pound of ideal body weight. Um, ideally, 30 grams of, to 35 grams of protein per meal. And I do think if you can try and eat three meals a day, we want to eat our protein, not drink our protein or take it in a supplement form. Although most women have to supplement with a protein shake of some sort or the essential amino acids, I find to reach that because they, most women can't eat that much. Yeah. And you're, right? you're, you, you too, you said you can't do more than 50 grams yeah. in a meal, right? 30 probably. Oh, 30 is like your max personally? 30, 30. Okay. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> My, I just have this complete off switch where it's like, nope, that's enough. And, I, and if I was to keep push through that, I would feel like I was really overeating. How, how important is it to get a baseline of what your hormones are right now before you even make all these changes? And um, what which labs do you recommend getting? Is it blood hormones? Is it a Dutch test? Like, let's get into the hormone conversation of actually testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're in your fertile years and you're in your 30s, 100%, you really want to get a baseline of hormones because every one of us is very different. There's some women that come into this world with the genetics to be estrogenic. I'm one of them. You know, I've got hips, I got an ass, I got breasts, I'm curvaceous, I'm very prone to weight gain. I had a history of endometriosis and ovarian cysts, and which is all very estrogen driven because estrogen is a growth hormone. When I started to go through menopause, my estrogen dropped about half, but if a doctor would have seen that, and just by looking at the labs, he would have said, you're perfect. Mm. You have perfect range. You have, you're not in a deficiency at all of estrogen. And yet I was missing a period. I'm hot flashing, night sweat. I had every symptom of estrogen deficiency because I, my body depends heavily on estrogen to feel good. When the next woman, I always use my sister as a comparison, she's this kind of straight up and down, super wiry, super muscular, tight, couldn't put on a pound of weight if she even tried. And she's a sugar fiend. Like all she, she should weigh 300 pounds. I'm not even joking. And she has stayed slim, trim, fantastic looking her whole life. She's test, she's androgenic. Her body depends on testosterone. So she could lose her estrogen. She doesn't even notice. If she loses testosterone, she feels like death. And so we want to get at this baseline because what is normal for you isn't normal for the next person or what's in that range, right? The range for estrogen, for instance, it goes from like, if you're between five and 500, <laughs> you're good. You're good. And it's so ridiculous. Even a guy's, like a guy's goes from 300 to a thousand, I think it is, Crazy. or 1200. And you want you know, you want to be what is great for you. And you and I were talking about before, even just how sensitive are you to those hormones? There's a lot of endocrine disruptors like xenoestrogens, for instance, that act like estrogen and will sit on the estrogen receptor and block it from your own estrogen. And so you think you have way too much estrogen, but actually you have way too much xenoestrogen and not enough of your estrogens acting on that receptor. Mm. Heavy metals can block it. Like yeah. this is a very, very common. So we want to be able to see like, okay, when you feel your best, which is typically when you're in your 20s or 30s and you before you start getting those hormonal problems, where is your testosterone if you're a man? 
Where's your estrogen and progesterone if you're a woman and your testosterone as a woman? Testosterone is our most abundant hormone. Women don't know that. They all think that testosterone is just for the guy. Right. Well, we produce more testosterone than we do estrogen or progesterone. So testosterone, we want to see where is it at when you feel great, when you feel like you're looking good, you're feeling good, so that when you start heading into your, you know, between the ages of 35 and 40 is when we hit perimenopause now which most women don't know that either. Like they don't realize that that's when you start to lose progesterone because you don't ovulate as often. And if you're not ovulating as often, you're not going to be producing progesterone. So between the ages of 35 and 40 and things start to shift and that little bit of weight gain starts to come on or your period starts to get worse, you start to have insomnia, you have all these little symptoms start to very slowly creep up in your late 30s. That's your sign that things are starting to shift. And this is when you want to get on it. You don't want to wait till you're 47, you're a hot mess, you're 20 pounds overweight, can't sleep, and now you're going to go, okay, I need help with my hormones, things are really bad. No, the sooner you can get on this, the better. And unfortunately, majority of doctors out there won't won't treat a woman until she is in menopause. And even then, it's very challenging to find a doctor that will treat you properly with bioidentical hormones. Yeah, well said. It's so important to be proactive here, not not reactive for both men and women. On that point of doctors, it's, it's very difficult to find those doctors that are open to running those labs and even understand the difference between the reference range, as you pointed out, is ridiculous, versus the functional range for that person's unique um, needs, as you pointed out, your sister more androgen dominant versus you more estrogen dominant. So what are, what is your advice for those listening and watching who wanna find a practitioner to order those labs and they understand those labs? How could they go, how, how do they go about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not gonna find that with your medical doctor. The medical system will test through blood if they agree to test. They won't tell you when to test. So if you're a fertile woman, you really need to test on day 21 of a cycle so that you have something to compare it to because our hormones fluctuate like crazy from week to week, day to day. They're all over the place in an entire month cycle. So day 21 is when we have an estrogen and a progesterone surge so that we can see where are the levels supposed to be at, relative, you know, somewhat into where yours are. So day 21, you can do blood if you're in your fertile years. However, blood is only testing total amount of hormones. And that is bound to sex hormone binding globulin. You can think of that as a bus that travels your, like all your hormones have to get on this bus. It travels around your system, but your hormones have to get off the bus in order to be utilized by that cell. And then they become free and available hormones when they're off the bus. So blood is only testing what's on the bus. And so we want to see what's free and available because you can look like you have this incredible amount of hormones. Like I said, if someone had checked mine back then when I was hitting that menopause, my estrogen looked fine. But if you looked at my free levels, it was not fine. I was in menopausal range. Mm. So I was getting, because I was on thyroid medication, my sex hormone binding globulin had gone really high and bound up my estrogen and my testosterone. So I wasn't able to utilize it. And so blood work rarely really tells us much, unfortunately, for the fertile woman. As you start getting through into your 40s, you'll get a little bit better of a picture because now we can test follicular stimulating hormone, which tells us how much the brain is trying to get your ovaries to produce estrogen. And then if that's high, then you know, okay, this person's kind of heading into menopause depending on where that number is. Once you're into menopause, blood work is actually quite accurate and is the gold standard. So menopause, go for it because it's gonna, you don't have, hormones usually. They're so low that it's very accurate. And if you get an SHBG with it, even better, because now we know if that's elevated, then you really don't have any hormones. <laughs> right. The alternative to it is either a saliva hormone test or a urine metabolite test. 
I've, I use both, but I prefer urine metabolite testing and I do it usually with all of my clients. I have them test via blood on the same day I have them test their urine mm. and urine metabolite testing is a 24 hour test. It's testing the metabolites of the hormones, which gives you a reflection of free available hormone levels. So you get a really big picture. We get to see like, are you more androgenic? Are you more estrogenic? Do you have metabolites that could increase your risk of breast cancer and you don't do well? Which phase do you not do well with? Um, most women, they're down, all these women are downing DIM, d and yeah. methane, because yeah. they think they have estrogen dominance. Right. Every woman thinks she's estrogen dominant. And so they're sapping, they're like draining yeah. their estrogen by taking DIM. And I'm like, whoa, estrogen's the most important hormone that a woman has. That is what's going to make you feel your best in your menopausal years is if you replace the estradiol. That will prevent heart disease by like 48%. It prevents Alzheimer's, dementia by 75%. Like the list goes on. So we want that estrogen but we want to see how we're metabolizing it because that's where things can go haywire with the estrogen. And if you push down certain pathways, then yes, a little bit of dim could be called for. But if you if you do fine in that phase one and you're just not methylating, which is phase two, taking dim is gonna dump all of these metabolites into the system and you're not methylating, which means you're not gonna get it out and you're gonna recirculate them. Yeah. So you have to be really careful. And it's not just this willy nilly, like you see all these clinics that are popping up right now, these pellet clinics where it's just like bringing people through and let's put in your testosterone pellets and androgenize the crap out of you as a woman. And then here's your dim. They give dim to every single woman that comes through the door. Crazy. And that is not how you should be treated men or women, you want to be individualized. You want somebody that's going to look at your hormones. They're going to look at your metabolites. They're going to understand what they're looking at and be able to come up with a full picture plan for you, a very functional plan for you to feel your best. And that looks different for each person. And finding just a functional doctor isn't always the answer either. I have come across countless naturopaths and functional medicine practitioners that have no clue what they're doing when it comes to hormones because that's not their specialty. And so you want to find somebody that that is what they do. That's it, hormones. And it's not a pellet clinic, not to start. I don't want to diss pellets. They do have their place and some people feel fantastic on them. But if you want that individual care, you're going to find somebody that's going to pay attention to you and that is going to do this big picture of all of the different factors that are, can influence the hormones um, when it comes to menopause and perimenopause. And for men, menopause, you guys go through menopause, which you start to lose your testosterone. And that also has a lot of timing to it. And we don't want to jump straight to hormones if we don't have to. And there's so many nuances to it that you have to be really careful. Such a great explanation of how this needs to be custom. And there's so many moving parts. A brilliant job describing that. So hopefully you understand that it's important to work with the right practitioner. Karen could be that practitioner for you, by the way, and get the right test done. Um, these uh, mm -hmm. metabolites, looking at the hormone metabolites, very important. Like I use the Dutch test. Is that what you use as well? Or is mm -hmm. it some? Yeah. Yep. Dutch test is fantastic. Great test. You know, that test alone could put an end to breast cancer forever if every woman got that test, or even men, right? We saw Suzanne Summers recently passed away from years and years of battling breast cancer. If Suzanne Summers would have gotten the Dutch test done years ago, she would have saw, look, your estrogen is going down this pathway and it's damaging your DNA. Uh, let's support your liver and let's let's get this metabolized better, right? These are things yeah. that, you, that are so crucial for both men and women. I, I have some follow-up questions on what you just shared. Number one, you mentioned that the thyroid medication you were taking increased your sex hormone binding globulin, made you feel worse. Um, is it all thyroid meds that do that? Or is it T4 or T3? Uh, could you explain a little bit more about which thyroid meds do that? More so T3. 
Okay. So if you're on desiccated thyroid or T3 only therapy, monotherapy, you're going to see a rise in SHBG. Um, if you're on T4 only, which is most common, um, most wrong as well. <laughs> yeah. But if you're on T4 only, right. not I don't see it affecting SHBG as much. Some people, yes, it makes it still go up, especially if they're on a higher dose. Um, but I definitely see that the T3 medication really makes it go up. And that's what made it go up in my own. So T4, mm -hmm. let's talk about that a little bit. Because a lot mm -hmm. of um, students I work with, and sometimes I'll do these lab reviews, and they're on T4, uh, they're not converting to T3. So they'll have very low free T3. Or maybe they are converting to free T3, but their reverse T3 is very high. And it's you know not allowing the, t the for, uh, t T3 to get into the cell. Excuse me. Um, I was making a point here and I lost the point. Uh, the, <laughs> the point was that, uh, oh, the, and the liver helps with that conversion too. So a lot of doctors are not liver, even looking at liver, liver functions. Could you, so could you explain if you're mm -hmm. on a T4 medication, we're not telling you to get off of it. This is not medical advice, but what are some questions to ask their doctor to even know if it's actually making a difference for them? First off, make sure you always have a reverse T3 and a free T3 tested. Doctors don't understand reverse T3, so they'll never test it because they have no idea how to interpret the results. Mm -hmm. You want your reverse T3 to be under 15. When mine went from 15 to 19 is when I started to rapidly gain weight. And so that was a very small jump. And I was on desiccated thyroid and I was thriving on it. And then my reverse T3 went up too high because my T4 was converting into reverse T3, more so than free T3. Looked great on labs. Everything looked okay yeah. with on, on desiccated thyroid, but it was not okay. And so you really want to make sure, even if it's just so that you can see what is your free T3 and what is your reverse T3? If you can't get reverse T3, like in Canada, there's no lab to, that will test it. It actually has to go down to California. So a naturopath can test it for you in Canada, but doctors usually don't can't. It's, it's really stupid. It's and they also stupid. in Canada won't test past free T4 unless there's a problem with free T4. Yeah, uh, so stupid. Or you pay for it, yeah. Which, which is fine. Pay for it, you guys. Just pay for it. Yeah, it's worth it. It's like it. $35. Yeah. It's nothing. So I always tell people, go in to, when you go to get your lab work done, say to them, I will pay for the free T3 or else they won't. It'll just, even if it's marked off on a lab, it will not get tested. So just offer to pay for it. But yeah, so if you see, let's say you just get a free T4 and a free T3, if you can get that much, and you see that your free T4 is in good range, it's middle of the range or above, but your free T3 is at the bottom of the range, so bottom of the range is typically about 2.5 on most labs in the States. If it's 2.6, which I see all the time, or 2.5, your doctor won't say anything. They'll say you're in range. They'll say you have no thyroid problem. That tells us, though, if your free T3 is lower than T free T4, that's telling us that your reverse T3 is likely elevated yeah. and you've got metabolic slowdown. Yeah. And this is really, really common. Um, it will do this if you fast too much, if you go too low carb, yeah. <laughs> um, if you're sick, if you've got any chronic illness. Um, mine, I was heavy metals. It was due to heavy metals. I had a horrible conversion problem. I think I've had it my whole for my whole life because I have no mercury feelings, I but my mom did. So I think yeah. it, a lot of that came from her, which is yeah. also what drove a lot of my hormone problems was the heavy metals. I was through the roof on mercury and lead. I know you had mercury problems too, right, Ben? Yeah, that's my story. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I had eight fillings and then my mom had them when she gave birth to me. So I, I got the I got hit twice <laughs> with it and the lead my mom gave me. So yeah, met, metals drove up my reverse T3 to your point. Yeah. Oh, it, it did. I didn't know that. Yeah, it did. Back in 2015 uh, through 2018, when I was looking at these labs, it was super high. I was like in the uh, mid-20s, my reverse T3s. Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and like in the high end of reverse T3 range is 23 on most labs, 21 or 23. And mine went to 19 and I, and I got and affected that like way. that. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So we really want to see that below 15 to be on the safe side. And so if you're on... 
T4 only medication, you really want to make sure you test your free T3 and your reverse T3 because what you'll hear across the board from 95% of thyroid patients is they don't feel good on their thyroid meds. Right. They're on T4 only. They're like, I have, I feel nothing. I'm still fat. I still have no hair. Meanwhile, like, their doctor is like looking at the labs and patting themselves on the back. Yeah. Oh, your free T4 looks great. You're no. doing great. Your TSH is low. Right. Everything's okay. It's the most like screwed up system. The way that thyroid patients are treated is we're so in the dark ages with it. I can't believe they haven't shifted that yet. Yeah. It makes me so mad. And it's it, th thyroid is a hormone that will naturally also come down with menopause. Well, a lot of women don't know that. So it's one of the hormones that you really want to keep eye on as you're going through that transitional time in perimenopause because without progesterone we start to get you know and then without estrogen on top of that even testosterone they all impact thyroid function and then insulin starts to get affected as you lose estrogen and progesterone so insulin resistance starts to go up because you're now not processing your blood glucose as well anymore without those hormones which also drives hypothyroidism and then hypothyroidism drives insulin resistance. So it's just this vicious circle and you keep, then you're gaining weight and then you start producing an inflammatory estrogen called estrone, which then causes more conversion problems between your T4 and T3 and starts to cause more inflammation, gut problems, you name it. It's just this like perfect storm for weight gain. Yeah. Uh, so important to understand this. And Maybe share this episode with your doctor or practitioner so they can understand what we're talking about here in a respectful way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, at, at what point, Karen, should a woman consider taking bioidentical hormones? There's still a stigma around taking hormones, and there is a right way mm -hmm. to do it. You teach this. So at what point should, we con should women consider it, and what is the right way to go about it? Mm -hmm. Well, as I was saying earlier, like, we tend to be left to our own devices until things are so severe that a doctor will then say, okay, maybe you could have use some hormones. And that's really the wrong way to go about it because we want to catch this early before the onset of all of this disease that can start to happen as you lose these vital hormones. These hormones are not just sex hormones. They're not just to have us bleed every month and to have sex and to be fertile and grow children. We have hormone receptors on every organ in our body. We need these hormones to feel our best. And as you start losing ovarian function in your late 30s, early 40s, there's nothing that's going to bring that back. Now, there's a time and a place, let's say in your 30s, when you start to lose these hormones that you can take certain supplements that will help your body to keep those hormones being pumped out for a little while longer. It's like, we're just going to take them. We're going to squeeze what we can out of the ovaries a little bit longer. That's things like maca. Um, great for men as well, maca. It's yeah. really great for testosterone. It's really great for perimenopausal women. Um, we've got, you know, all the adaptogens that can, if you can support the adrenal system, the adrenal system will kick in and make some of these hormones that the ovaries make. So paying attention to that, we can take Vitex that helps with our progesterone. We can take phytoestrogens like uh, flaxseed. Flaxseed is the most phytoestrogenic food. Some people can tolerate fermented organic soy, you know, like tofu, tempeh. I can't, but <laughs> that is actually a very high phytoestrogen and it has shown to be safe in a lot of people. Uh, there's black cohosh sage. So there's all these great supplements, great things that you can do and changing your diet, watching your stress. All of these things have to be part of that picture. And I, and I want everybody to really get that because I'm not saying that those things aren't important and they won't help because they will a hundred percent, but you will only ovulate so much. It's like we come into this world with a set amount of eggs. When those eggs are done, you no longer ovulate and you no longer produce progesterone. You don't produce the majority of your progesterone. You can produce some from the adrenal system and the spinal cord, but very small amounts. The spinal the cord? I didn't know that. I know. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Very small amount. Wow. So as you lose ovulation, 
which is very typical now in our late 30s, early 40s, you don't produce progesterone. So progesterone drops by about 75% by the time you're in your early 40s. And now you've got this estrogen that's kind of unopposed, and that's where everyone thinks they're estrogen dominant, when in most right. cases it's just that they, they, have pl- they have the right amount of estrogen, they just have too little progesterone to counterbalance that growth. Once this happens, there's nothing you can do to bring back ovulation. And so you can't, that's when I say, like, you can't diet your way out of this. You can't supplement your way out. When the hormones are gone, they're gone, except for the small amount that you're making from the adrenal system, which let's be honest, which, what woman out there right now is not stressed out and have cortisol problems? Either we're too high or we're too low. I've probably done a thousand Dutch tests with a thousand different cortisol tests And I'll tell you what, very, very rarely do I see a woman that's got this like perfect amount of cortisol where I'm like, oh my God, it's perfect. (laughs) It's coming up the right way. It's going down the right way. It's right in between the two. Like it just doesn't happen. We're, We're living in a very stressful environment. And even if your lifestyle isn't stressful, the environment is stressful. The toxic load, the heavy metals, the pollution, this is all stress to our system. So the lighting, the lighting is a stress. So our body will preferentially make that cortisol because it's a life or death hormone. So it's going to be like, screw up making progesterone. We can't, we don't have time for that. Let's just make cortisol because this person's highly stressed out constantly in fight or flight. We got to get ready to roll here. We're going to pump out cortisol. And so you, your body just kind of, and I know this for a fact because I've done so much testing because I have seen women in their 40s and majority of them don't have progesterone. So you can't tell me that, oh, the adrenal system just kicks in and makes all the progesterone that you're going to need to sail through menopause. I'm sorry, but I rarely ever, ever see that. If a woman's in menopause and she has, you know, she does her hormones, there's never progesterone or it's negligible. It's like 0.2 amount. And so it's not enough to give you the health benefits of that progesterone. It's just not. What your adrenal system is doing is not enough in 99% of the cases that I've seen. So you're left with one option, which is to replace those hormones or to take phytoestrogens or things that can mimic these hormones, which are on a much smaller scale. But some women have to go that route because they have maybe a history of breast cancer, like estrogen driven breast cancer. So there are a small subset of women who it's not safe to take hormones, but for the majority of women, it is safe. And people will say, oh, but menopause is natural. We're supposed to lose our hormones. We, were, we never lived this long, right. Ben. We never lived this yeah. long. So we, we don't have the tools inside and so we normally would have died between the ages of 40 and 50 50 being the top end like it was normal for women to die by 45 right when menopause hit it's like interesting once again we're just here to procreate and once we can't it's like see ya (laughs) you're no longer good to the tribe we're gonna say see you later you can't procreate anymore out you go and, but now we're living longer than ever. And so we have to give our, we have to support the system. The alternative is what? You're going to start developing osteoporosis, almost guaranteed. Like it's, it's up there to almost 100%. You will develop osteoporosis if you do not replace your estrogen, estradiol specifically. And progesterone and testosterone, also very important for bone formation. So what's the alternative to that? Then you're going to break your hip and then you're going to be bedridden. You're going to be, you know, 50% chance of dying in the first year after that. You have to break your hip or let's say heart disease. We know that women that replace their estrogen have a 48% reduction in cardiovascular mortality if they replace their estrogen in menopause. So what's the alternative? Are you going to say when you have heart disease and your doctor says you're going to have to have a stint put in or you're going to have a heart attack, are you going to say, oh, you know what? It's natural. This is a natural part of life. This is just aging, right? No, you're going to say, give me the drugs, give me the medication, give me the heart surgery. 
And yet we won't take the natural bioidentical, which is exactly what your body makes, hormones that can help prevent these diseases, these number one killers. So we know from the research that hormones are safe. We even know that women that replace their estradiol have actually a decreased rate in developing breast cancer, which most people don't know that. Yes. And it was the Women's Health Initiative that screwed this all up. That's but right. when you looked at the evidence, it actually showed that women that replaced their estrogen only in the estrogen only camp had a reduction in breast cancer. The women that took progestin, which is what's in your birth control, ladies, had the increased risk in breast cancer. It's birth control pills. It is fake chemical endocrine disruptors that are in birth control pills that raise your risk of breast cancer, not bioidentical hormones. So good, Karen. For those who want to learn more about how they could work with you, because I imagine you inspired a whole bunch of women who are like, I need Karen in my life. How, where do they go? Is it just KarenMartell.com or is there somewhere specific that you want them to go? Uh, no, KarenMartell.com. And then of course the podcast, the Hormone Solution Podcast. We've got almost 300 episodes. We're top 50 podcasts on iTunes. Um, Great. I've got great guests. Ben was just a guest on mine. So you're going to hear him on mine, which was a, such a great conversation. So Everybody has to listen to that one. Um, but yeah, that's where, and then on, on social media, I'm Karen Martell Hormones. We'll put all that down below. Um, 300 episodes is very admirable. You know, the 90% of people who start a podcast don't get past episode 10. <laughs> that's this actual oh, stat. Wow. 90%. <laughs> So you're at 300, uh, about to get at 300. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. you're, you're a great interviewer and also a great guest. I, I got to see both sides <laughs> of you here. And Karen and I will be hanging out in beautiful Sarasota, Florida on December 8th, 2023 for Dr. John's event. Uh, I'm going to put a link down below for that event. We would love to see you in person. You could live yes. stream it too, but we'd love to see you in person and hug you and get some oxytocin flowing with you. Um, so we'll put a coupon code for that down below. And Karen, I want to acknowledge you for um, your energy and enthusiasm and your zest for teaching the world how to optimize their hormones, which optimizes their quality of life, which optimizes the, the world and society and brings more peace and happy people. Uh, I just love what you're doing. I'm, I'm glad. I'm grateful we finally got to connect. And I have a final question on that. I want to take a minute to share something with you as we take a break from the video you're watching. You know, one of the most common things I see to why people don't have enough energy levels, they have trouble building lean muscle mass, they have brain fog, fatigue, and they don't feel good is because of a deficiency in a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a very important hormone to have in a healthy amount for both men and for women. So how do you reclaim your vitality? How do you reclaim this very important fat burning and muscle building hormone well, you can do it with a powerful supplement called Upgraded T. It has been my go-to for naturally elevating testosterone levels. Upgraded T is from Upgraded Formulas, and it contains the highest quality of ingredients that have been proven scientifically to increase testosterone production. Now, as I mentioned, if you're a woman watching this, this is very important for you just as a man watching this right now. Upgraded T is a natural and safe way to boost testosterone levels. When you boost testosterone levels, it's going to increase your sex drive, vitality. It could help replace fatigue with all-day energy. It'll help you lose that stubborn belly fat. Uh, testosterone is required for fat burning, so it'll help you with the last 5 to 10 pounds that you're looking to lose. It helps you be in a better mood, helps with your memory and focus. So here's the three-step approach. Step one. Take two capsules of upgraded tea with water every morning. It does not break your fast. You can have it with food or without food. Step number two, notice your energy levels and dominate your day with more confidence and more vitality. Step number three, wake up the next day having better sleep and just keep doing what you're doing. As simple as that. So if you want to get your hands on upgraded formulas, upgraded tea, and any of their awesome products like their upgraded magnesium and their hair mineral analysis testing kit, Head over to UpgradedFormulas.com, and if you use the coupon code KETOSIS at checkout, they're going to give you 15% off your entire order. That is UpgradedFormulas.com, KETOSIS at checkout. We're going to drop that link down below, and let's get back to today's video. Um, I talk a lot about my favorite supplement in the world, which I call vitamin G. 
Uh, it's anti-inflammatory. It could increase your progesterone if you want. It could <laughs> lower inflammation. It's a vitamin gratitude. And I want to ask you what you are grateful for today, Karen. Oh, well, I am grateful for you today. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm really happy that we met and we've connected and that we're going to be hanging out soon. So I, that's what I'm grateful for. I love it. I'm also vitamin G for you as well, Karen. Yeah. So <laughs> hopefully we'll see you with, uh, hopefully we'll see those watching and listening uh, in mm -hmm. Sarasota with Karen and myself. So Karen, thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm already looking forward to round two, but definitely looking forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Thank you again. Definitely. Thank you.